So um, I will rush you through the um, through this to a few slides introducing things, and then the main part of the the talk will be interviews that are pre-recorded. And if there are questions, some of the people are um, that, that that have have recorded, and, and and others are in the in the part of those sessions in the two kind rooms after the meeting. So what happened in the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation first? Hmm. Who we are? Well, I think that we can skip over that slide pretty quickly because by now probably you all know who we are. A nonprofit. We are um, um, officially a nonprofit um, for the Erlang and Elixir community and all the other languages on the beam um, to actually grow and improve the ecosystem. We're here for everyone. Um, that's logos of all the languages that at some point. I think not long ago, uh, are running on the beam. Uh, actually, um, so there's, um, I, I hope I get them all together. There's Erlang, there's Elixir, there's LFE, let's play with Erlang. There's Luel, a Lua on Erlang. That's Gleam, I think. That's a closure flavored Erlang. I assume that's Caramel. That's um, Fika. Um, oh boy, I don't know those. Um, yeah. The, 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 this list is growing, which is very interesting. So it's growing very, very fast. Um, uh, so I don't remember all the logos anymore. Um, you can head to the website. There is actually a page on the community uh, where every all the languages are described with, uh, with a logo and little description. Um, that's the numbers as of today. Um, I just looked them up. Um, we have 26 sponsors, 139 supporting members. That's the members who pay uh, uh, annual fee. Uh, then we have 12 lifetime supporting members, basically pay a larger fee and be lifetime uh, supporting member. Um, 601 basic members um, on the free tier. And we have currently 12 working groups. Um, the board that kind of like steers all the thing, um, um, pretty much um, like, like from the start, this is kind of like the initial founding board still but um, we have an election soon and a little bit more about the election later on on the last slide. Um, um, shortly saying hi to our sponsors. Thank you for sponsoring us. That's the current set of sponsors as of today. Um, we'll see how many come back and how many we can kind of like um, get them to join. If you work at the company or you have enough money or you know a company who could sponsor us, Send them, send them our way. Um, we are really happy to grow this list and, 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 and increase the funding of everything. Um, a very short run up uh, over the, all the working groups um, uh, currently. Um, the, most of the working groups are mentioned in the interviews, um, but uh, I pick out a few um, here on this slide which are not mentioned in interviews. There's the language interoperability working group. Um, that's working on that the different languages on the beam work better together, um, work on calling conventions and, and, and tooling to make this uh, run more smoothly because that would increase the usability of, uh, of the different artifacts in the languages quite a lot if you could just like mix and match and don't have to um, um, do much about um, how this is done. Um, external process communication, I think that the name says it all, I'm talking about external processes, talking to other languages. Um, um, what they're actually at the moment doing, I don't know yet. I have to say, um, I, I didn't reach anybody before the talk. Um, the security working group um, has been busy. There, there is a guide about like how to do secure coding on the beam. Um, Kind of like guidelines of how to do it. it's a very nice guide um, um, check it out um, and there's also we work on software bill of materials um, I see Duncan in the in the uh, in the audience so I, I have to mention this <laughs> so hi to Duncan um, so software bill of materials is like uh, kind of like a, uh, a bill of materials with all the versions of all the artifacts that are that's a very short version um, if you want to know more about um, chat with Duncan afterwards in the token room, which you probably will join. Um, and other working groups we will see in interviews. Um, and we will start the interviews. Um, 
with Thomas de Pierre, um, um, one of the um, contributors um, to OTP that has been funded by the foundation, uh, recently a funded project and probably one more to come up. And he has ideas for many more. So let, let us hear it from him. Hi, Thomas. Um, so um, I have you here for kind of like two reasons. For one thing, you are in several working groups. Um, um, yeah. Which are these? Um, hi, Pierre. So I am part of the Build and Packaging Working Group and the Observability Working Group. And I'm also working with the Embedded Working Group that you are part of. So yeah. the Embedded Working Group, why is that? Um, that's because the Embedded Working Group took on um, a project I work on for the Erlang Foundation, which was to um, speed up um, printing floats to string um, in OTP through uh, bringing a new algorithm into OTP to do that called Roo. And the Embedded Working Group was interested because that was um, fitting with what they were doing and for their communications. And so um, they ended up adopting that project and I worked with them to implement that into OTP. Yeah, we probably need to change the name of the Embedded Working Group soon, like not only embedded systems, but also stuff embedded into OTP. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, so that's it, kind of like that sounds amazing, like a new algorithm for printing floats that that is <laughs> yeah. unexpected. Yeah, that was quite unexpected for me too, right? Um, I that's not exactly the kind of stuff I work on every day, um, but I ended up. Um, I think this one was on Hacker News. I always ended up going through my links every day, and I saw a blog post about that, and that was interesting. And I looked into the comments, and someone in the comments was saying, you know, there is even better than what this blog post talk about. It's called Rue. It's new. It's from 2018. And I was interested, looked at it. It happened that at the time, I was also looking with the Observability Working Group on things. And it happened that when you do observability stuff, Sorry, I was singing the reflection in my eyes. Um, when you do observability stuff, you end up doing a lot of uh, float to string because we send a lot of JSON with float for metrics. Because ah, it's really yeah. metrics. And so I was looking at that at the time. I was like, hey, if we can make that faster, that's great for everyone. And so I looked at what the um, what OTP was using to do that. And it happened that um, there's multiple ways, but one of the ways which is used by nearly all JSON uh, encoder like you know JSON, um, G, uh, but not GP because GP is in an if, but uh, Poison in Elixir, um, JSON -E, I think. JSX in, in probably. JSX, yes, definitely. Yeah. They all use um, they all use a function part of the pretty printer for OTP, mm. and this part is in Erlang. This is implementing the standard library in Erlang. This is not a BIF. And so it was relatively easy to modify and to bring a new algorithm into that because that mm -hmm. was Erlang code with tests and everything, which is quite nicer than having to deal with a BIF. And so, so I ended up working a little bit on it, trying to see how hard it would be and if it would be really faster. And it ended up being quite fast on some benchmark. And I offered it to the Erlang Foundation. And they were interested in funding it. So that's how I ended up with the embedded group working on that. Yeah, oh, excellent. So how much how much speed up did you manage in the end? Um, so from the benchmark we have inside OTP, which are good, but definitely not covering the whole gamut of things, right? Yeah. It's always benchmark. Benchmark always a bit low lie. Um, we get um, four times speed up without- Four the, times speed up? Yeah, uh, four X wow. speed up before the JIT and uh, five X with the JIT. So the JIT gives us something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the JIT gives us something, something right. but we already get faster, quite faster before. So that's quite mm -hmm. nice. Um, I think there is probably, if we wanted to keep this like that in OTP for a long time, there would definitely be some performance we can squeeze. So there's definitely mm -hmm. some place where we can get a little bit more performance. Fine tune. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is probably fine tuning you could do, but um, this is probably not going to be something we'll spend time on because um, there's another proposal I made with the uh, Erlang Foundation, which is to bring this algorithm into the BIF used mm -hmm. to transform float to list or to binary. Um, mm -hmm. This is something the OTP team have said they were interested in. So we know they would accept that. And that would be an extension of the API of these BIFs. Mm -hmm. And that would be easier to maintain because the um, reference implementation of this algorithm is in C. 
which is what mm -hmm. the baseline. So it would be easy to just port this. And that should give us a far faster uh, result because for a lot of oh, reasons, yeah. the, the way we do all this algorithm really, mm -hmm. really match well with C and with control over your memory space. Mm -hmm. um, because that's a big thing that this equation bring, which we lose once we run it in Erlang because, well, we, we don't control exactly the size of our things anymore. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, without going to details, um, this algorithm is optimized to fit into 64 bits for integers. Ah, uh, yeah, and we have less. And 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 we have less on TP. So we are forced to move into big num in some case, which is a huge cost. The whole idea of these 64 bits for integer the whole idea of this algorithm is to avoid the big numbers that are using mm -hmm. other algorithm to do that. So if we were able to move into C, I expect to get a really good speed up there. Um, it's really hard to give an, an order of magnitude because there's a lot of variables there, but I hope at least another two to three times speed up and probably closer to an order of magnitude speed up. Yeah, so, I would okay. expect that, yeah. That and, would uh, and that would be also used by the Erlang, by the Erlang implementer or we'll replace the current Sp yes. Spread of Erlang implementation, yeah. Yes, because that would be exactly, that would give us the same results that we have right now. Yes. Because it's already compatible. It's already compatible. The wall, mm -hmm. is, there is even a comment at the top of this function before I touch it was saying, uh, compatible with float to list and list to float. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so that would be compatible. So we could replace this whole function by just calling the BIF, right? Excellent. So, okay. So yeah. Cool. Would, who would have thought that such, such a speed up is still possible? And something like yes. printing floats. Yeah, excellent. I mean, yeah, that's one of the big things. It's it's interesting because uh, the default algorithm that is used everywhere is really, really not efficient. Like it's really, really slow to yeah. the point that it's like if you write float to disk into um, format, right, like a CSV or JSON or something, transforming into float, casting in the float into string is the thing that is going to bottleneck you. Mm -hmm. Like you are CPU bottlenecked by printing the float to string, which is like even on a spinning disk, which is a bit not no, not what That's you're used quite to slow. these days. Yep. <laughs> and um, it happened that the prime is quite complex, right? And that's mm -hmm. why. And all our algorithms date from 1996, basically for the most optimized right. one, up until 2018. And um, someone that does something totally different in his day-to-day -day work, uh, his name is Half Adams, and he worked at Google on Bazel, which is a build system. Mm -hmm. And on his free time, he implements his toy JVM. And he mm -hmm. happened to encounter that problem when implementing his toy JVM and to invent this whole new algorithm that solves it faster than everything for his free time on his free time. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in general, like um, are you happy about like funded projects by the so kind of like as one of our targets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean this I'm is quite a good happy. thing to have. Yes, um, I'm quite happy because there are a lot of things where um, OTP or the ecosystem would need work to happen for the mm -hmm. well-being of the ecosystem, which have been really hard to get done, right? Yeah. Um, relying on people free time is nice, but there are limits to what they can do, especially when, uh, let's be honest here, there is a really small amount of people that maintain a lot of the ecosystem. Um, I, I mean, I know everyone in the room which probably knows the name, but I'm thinking of people like Fred, Tristan, uh, Benoit, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, we, we all know these names that maintain a lot of the current ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the OTP team does a lot of good work on the beam, but they have limited time and also their own internal customers too. So having the ability for the whole community to come in and say, listen, this is, these are things that matters for us and we're ready to make them work better and do that by funding because that's how you people can you know spend time on things is because they need to fund if you want to do that reliably um that's pretty good and i think that's good for everyone in the community and for the long term for the beam excellent um i think we are at the end of the time slot i'm looking at the watch a little bit um i have another interview coming up very soon yeah <laughs> um so thank you for your time um, and thank you for your insights and thank you for your good work um thank you So that was Thomas and the next interview, I think I don't need to introduce was Jose Valim. Um, um, he wants to tell us about um, some really exciting new working group that he started um, 
which had a, which had our first meeting today also, um, and that was really interesting. I joined immediately. Hi, Jose. Um, so you're here for a very special announcement. Um, I heard um, that there is a new working group in town. Yes, uh, I'm glad uh, that to be the chair of the machine learning work, working group that hopefully is going to explore uh, a lot of new things and uncharted waters in uh, the BIM community and the Erlang ecosystem. That's excellent. So I'm really, really glad that numerical comp computation is getting more in the focus because it always bothered me that people always say, yeah, Erlang is not good or Elixir is not good for numerical computation. It's like, what? Well, nothing is missing in the language. It's all libraries in all the languages. Um, so I'm really happy that this gets some focus and something spins off that. So how is it going in the numerical working group um, um, so far? Yeah, so we have just started. And so uh, my work uh, so far, and I think it's going to be for uh, some period of time is getting uh, like-minded people to join because uh, it's, a, it's a whole new area for us. So for example, I don't have my knowledge on this area is like a decade old, outdated. So we need people who are interested in, you know, interested in machine learning, numerical computing to join and we can exchange ideas and plan where we think we should focus on and um, put our forts and so on. So that has been kind of the effort. So we, we, we didn't have our first meeting yet. We're going to have it uh, in two days. Uh, soon is going to be the week this recording goes up. And uh, I think it's going to be, to be fun because we're more, I, I think I don't have anything to talk about besides introducing ourselves and putting faces to the names. Uh, and then we can start focusing on, on the, the work that we want effectively to do and to focus on. I know some of it's going to be related to Annex, the library that uh, we have released. Uh, but I, I'm looking, what I'm looking forward to, uh, especially within the working group is, you know, how we can um, collaborate with all the other languages on the Bing. So yes, we started working on this library for Elixir, but how can we make sure that we can use it from Erlang, we can use it from uh, other Bing languages and also the collaboration with uh, other uh, working groups. So for example, I can tell you now, uh, since you are the chair of the embedded working group, is that <laughs> today, uh, we just finished AOT compilation. So this uh -huh. is really nice because you can, for example, like train your network on your machine because you don't want to train it on the device. The device is going to be like, it's going to be super slow. So you can train your network on your machine and you can compile a, a executable, you know, a shared object file with the network parameters, all the code that you just ship to the device. So the device doesn't need to have all the dependencies. You can just- Then you do out. inference on the device as you normally do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds excellent. I, I'd love to play with this and on the grist board. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So I, I'm sure that, you know, that's exactly, I think one of the reasons why we have the working group is collaboration like yeah. this, because I'm pretty sure I have to do like things with cross population that I don't know about, but it's like the bread and butter of the embedded working group. I, you know, you're probably doing things like that all the time. And, uh, you know, and also like collaboration with build and packaging, because now you're talking about, you know, like I didn't know this, but like those things are uh, all those libraries for doing, you know, the GPU latency computations, like they are really, really big. Like, you know, we're talking like half giga stuff. So, you know, like how you're oh, going wow. to, uh, you know, uh, how you're going to work with build and packaging first, like to distribute this stuff. And there is also, uh, I think the working group is a great collaboration also with uh, hoping great collaboration with the OTP team. So there are some mm -hmm. things that uh, I think we'll have to improve on the Erlang side of things as well. And I think all those mm -hmm. things are very exciting. Excellent, very cool. Um, so you will be talking about Enix on this conference and another talk. So we don't go into details here. So I don't know what the ordering of the talks is by now at this point of the time, if this will be before or after. So listeners, either you already have heard the talk or go to the talk and listen to it, please. Uh, and if you missed it, look at the recording. Precisely, so. yeah. So uh, a lot of uh, interesting stuff happening. And I think uh, 
I'm really looking forward to everybody on the uh, machine learning working group to, you know, to, to do their contributions, get involved. And I'll be really happy to, you know, maybe next year for the next code in America, when we have to do this interview, I'll, I'll have a lot of stuff to talk about, uh, about the progress that we made, uh, hopefully so. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so, for having see me. You, see you around. Bye. Shortly stuck. So next here is from Miriam Penner, um, member on the board, also founding member on the board. Um, um, she is in many working groups and she will tell us about a few of those. Oh, start the video. Hi, Miriam. Um, so you are talking about the education working group to us today. So how did that go in the last year or years? It, I think that was a tough question for everyone. <laughs> how did it go last year? <laughs> we, we created the, the education group um, on 2019, on July 2019. Um, our goal was to increase adoption of uh, Fairlang and Elixir uh, languages uh, through education and training, of course. We, so what I did was to start talking with people in the universities and other educational institutions and some companies to see if they have there was interest for that, such a group and, and lots of people joined in. We, we start having our first meeting and we set up our, our strategies. Um, uh, we had a certain strategy for one to three years in which we wanted to increase the number of developers who have a basic language of the technologies in, in, er in Erlang and, and LXE. And we had a long-term strategy in which uh, we will increase the complexity of the trainings and the courses or, or, or the initiatives uh, we give to make people uh, have a better knowledge in advanced topics. Um, we had a few sessions, we did a lot of brainstorming and we had a lot of great ideas of things we could do. Uh, we talked about doing boot camps, uh, certifications, having a job board on the foundation webpage doing internships um, and all of that. But we thought it was not the best timing for those things. So we decided to postpone it for our long-term strategy and start with, with the essence of what we do, which is would be the trainings and things which are related to, to education. Yeah, we have strategy of in-person and, and it didn't quite work out with the pandemic. So we have to reevaluate yeah. our in-person yeah, to a virtual strategy. Um, we were really lucky because uh, Simon uh, and others suggested that we could re, re, um, relaunch the MOOC training. Uh, for those who are not familiar, there is a wonderful, absolutely wonderful training called Erlan MOOC on the Future Learn platform, a four week. Uh, by Simon Thompson, by the way. Thompson, yeah. For those who don't know him. And we, we, we rolled it out with a collaboration with the foundation. Uh, some of us uh, uh, were there. Uh, supporting the students uh, with Simon and that was a really good success and also as part of going virtual um, we had uh, we had to also uh, think about ways in which we could help the students get their trainings uh, in a more immediate way and that's when we we started talking with a uh, code being which runs uh, some some of the most important uh, uh, um, conferences uh, all around the world. And we we negotiated a super amazing rate for sending students to trainings and to sending students to the conferences. Um, and we have to roll, we started rolling it out with universities. So far in the last year, uh, we have sent 200 students uh, to wow. these conferences. Uh, that was very, very impressive. Uh, also, we increased uh, the, the the scope of the people receiving the trainings. And we decided to add women, to add underrepresented uh, people in tech. Um, so you have people from all around the world, from so India. So the scope from just students. Yeah, so first it was yeah. for students. And then we decided to broader it and include underrepresented people in tech. Yeah. So Excellent, yeah. 
uh, connecting with maybe, I mean, we just reach out to a community of students in Latin America, so female students, and they're, they're, giving, they're, they're, they're giving away these tickets to women in South America. We have given away tickets to people in India, to people in Africa, uh, a lot of people in Europe, a lot of people in America in general. And makes me really happy to, to, get, to, to make think little things that have an impact on, on these people. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like um, interesting, like how the pandemic keeps us apart, but at the same time brings us together in another way. Um, yeah. So, yeah. excellent. This is really interesting. And I, I really love it. I, and, and we have another 100 students uh, and minorities uh, scheduled 150, most likely, for, for the euro, for being euro. So you will hear and, soon. And on this conference, there are also students. Yeah, this conference, I believe. I believe we have 70, 80 students and oh, minorities. Wow, that's a for code being that would be a big group in person. Right now. <laughs> right yes. now, yes. <laughs> you can raise your hand if you are a part of us. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. That's wonderful. Um I think I didn't mention it, but one of the things we also worked in the beginning was uh the stipend program. Mm -hmm. Um we are a foundation. And yep. our job is to fund things that are worth funding. And we we needed to, as, as part of the mechanism of helping people get their funding for, for trainings and, and all the little things, we just decided to create the, the how do you say it, the procedure to mm -hmm. receive. For people to apply for, for funding, yeah. How uh, would that stipend gets allocated to a working group and gets approved by a working group and it has to get approved by the board? It's a whole step-by-step uh, -step internal guide of how these stipends get approved. And that was guide was defined by the education working group also last year. Mm -hmm. And so far we have given a few of them. And I invite you to see. Yeah, it, it's actually picking up. It, it was quiet in the beginning, but it, I think it's picking up. And I think when word gets out that like what kinds of things are funded by people hearing about funded things. So I think that will, yeah. I hope there will be a line soon. In the beginning, we, we intended it for trainings, courses, and, and like if you need to travel to a conference in India, you don't have the budget, you can ask for the budget for that. But now, but it's also being used for like, I wanna do this library and I need time and time costs money. So this is what it will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then, and going back to education, uh, also another, these things popping up here and there, um, there being a lot of conversations about uh, how we can get uh, the BIM languages closer to the Latin America communities. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, had conversations with some people who have materials and what will it take to make materials more available on the website, translate that, translate books, that's, that's thing on the making, there's nothing there's nothing I can point out at the moment, but that these are things that are happening within within the group, and and also um, don't quite is it cut? You can cut, right? right. So yeah, um, we had to cut the videos a bit. Um, as you just saw <laughs> and shorten them a bit because um, we are already overrunning the, the time slot. So next interview, we hear Freddy Bear um, about uh, observability and um, building and packaging working group. Hi, Fred. Uh, hey there. So you are here for two working groups today. Um, which working groups are these? Uh, the first one is the build and packaging working group, where it's probably the one where I have the most direct involvement uh, as a co-maintainer of Freebar 3. The other working group I'm active into is the observability uh, working group. And this one, I'm slightly less active. I'm an approver on the open telemetry Erlang Elixir projects, uh, but mostly don't do a lot of active development for this myself. So let's start with the last one. What, what's observability working group about? 
Right, so the observability working group has done a bunch of work when it comes to unifying some of the approaches to logging, to metrics, and now to tracing across both the airline and Elixir community. Uh, the work around observability in general is super interesting because there's this approach of how do we build libraries that work well for the airline principles and for the Elixir principles and there and all the other adjacent language in the ecosystem. Uh, but there's also this aspect, especially with open telemetry, which goes into asking the question of how do we make sure that all this beam specific stuff is also going to play nicely with uh, the other tooling that other programming languages have. Because in many companies, the people doing operations don't necessarily care which stack is being used um, for whatever they are operating at the point in time. Uh, it's really about having a uniform way of asking questions and finding answers about how their systems are running. And so there is a decent amount of collaboration in there in making sure that we do play nice with within the ecosystem and outside of it as well. So there has been an important milestone recently, uh, if I remember correctly, yes, uh, from the Slack yeah, channel. Very important milestone. The Open Telemetry project is essentially uh, taking the last many years of tracing stuff that was confusing Open Census and a bunch of other specifications and making you know, one standard to rule them all, which actually seems to be the one standard that's going to win a lot of these things. And um, hmm. they recently reached the milestone of version 1.0, which means that they had the trace specifications for distributed tracing completely out of the way. Uh, they're going to have upcoming updates for metrics and stuff like that. Um, but once the specification landed, there were only four programming languages who had a library that respected the entire specification. Uh, you know, there was Java and Python um, and whatnot, but Erlang and Elixir, because there's also an Elixir specific API for that, uh, was part of the only four language environments that supported that. No, that's excellent. Being ahead of the curve again. Yes. <laughs> cool. Good work. Yeah, cool. So back to build and packaging. So your two main, your main working group. So maybe a short intro what what this is about and what it's doing, and then we look into the specifics. So the build and packaging group has a lot of, um, I would say, loosely related interests. There's people maintaining Docker images and you know the Google the the GitHub actions that have to do with making good CI and CD builds. Uh, there's the build tools themselves, specifically us in Rebar 3. We now have people around the Caramel language who are joining. We've got people from the OTP team who maintain the compiler and a bunch of uh, these mechanisms around the user experience of building uh, that stuff. We've got people from the Hex project who are mostly concerned with, uh, package, uh, with package management, but for libraries. Um, and, and you know, it, it's a bunch of people working on these projects all on their own. But we get together uh, frequently for the meetings, but also in the channels where we do the development in order to keep that sort of communication channel open across all of our projects to have an overall view of what is going on within the community and making sure that we push uh, in a more unified direction in general. So, you know, we now are aware of changes that could be coming through the way OTP is built itself. Uh, of what their requirements would be if we wanted to move Rebar 3 within what they're doing, um, of where Hex is headed so that everyone can keep up at the same time, uh, what other languages in the ecosystem are trying to do, and what about the current setups are being problematic. We've got bigger players uh, being involved, for example, WhatsApp, who care about very large build in mono repos, which is different than what smaller open source developers would be doing. And, and for us, the big benefit there is just having this unified way of talking to each other and knowing what people are working on and what's coming ahead of the curve. So there's a lot of usefulness already happening without funded projects. Right. And um, mostly a lot of these projects would have been taking place regardless of whether the foundation would have been around or not. The big difference for us has been that the foundation gave us a really, really good pretext or context uh, in, in which we can talk together and have this going through, and in some cases to fund some of the efforts that we think could be beneficial to uh, many parts of the community at once. So yeah, speaking of funded project, there was one funded project so far. Um, right, yes. Uh, want to... 
Yeah, uh, Tristan, who is the uh, working group chair and also co-maintainer of Rebar3, maintaining uh, relics, maintaining the hex, uh, or co-maintaining the hex extensions for Rebar3, along with a few other people, um, got funding to take some time and develop the Relics 4.0 uh, release, which specifically for us meant having an easier way to work with container environments, uh, had to do with removing some stuff around EPMD, making it easier to do from within Docker images. And so, you know, it, it's one of the things that seems like it mostly benefits uh, Erlang folks early on, but is only possible because we have these um, contrasted views within you know, the, the folks handling the containers, the folks handling uh, some other parts, the work that Tristan has done about that has also been implemented in OTP and making it play well with other stuff, which uh, folks developing Mix now have the ability of pushing there with their own releases and everything like that. Um, so uh, we've been able to put that within Rebar 3.14, which has been released uh, through 2020. Excellent. Um, anything known about the future there in both working groups, maybe? So, um, yeah, so for the future, uh, specifically around the build and packaging working group, we're currently discussing what the next generation of the, compi the compiler API would look like for uh, Erlang OTP. So, you know, rather than just calling Erl C, um, over time, the, the thing that we found is that there are a few sharp edges in how it's being built. And we're currently having big discussions about what various build tools and environment would be requiring. For example, you know, what would Rebar 3 require to be working well, but that would also uh, work best with something like Bazel for people with large polyglot environments where Rebar 3 itself is not necessarily the best fit for that one. Um, so that's probably the one big discussion that we have going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're involved or getting involved with the Google Summer of Code efforts within the foundation um, to do stuff like unify the hex authentication flows across environments, uh, because right now there's some duplication in how this is being handled. Uh, and, you know, we're always on the lookout for more projects of the kind. On the observability point of view, uh, there's work ongoing that was going on before, but is still ongoing about how to better, uh, you know, do the instrumentation of frameworks like Phoenix um, or plugs. I, I don't recall the exact details because I'm not the one working on that stuff. But, you know, in making sure that the instrumentation is done at the proper scope. Is it being too low level where it becomes like debugging your own instance or is it high level enough to work with uh, the open telemetry efforts that will be uh, getting more and more integration over time? Um, the other thing that's being looked there also is that the open telemetry spec is going to get updated for metrics. Um, and we're probably going to need more hands to help drive the development right now, given people are getting a lot busier on the working group as well. Okay, clear call to action for everybody. Join the observability working group and <clears throat> lend your hands. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's the thing, right? We, we, we're, we are currently having the elections for the board, and this is an administrative role for people who like to, I don't know, be in meetings and manage budgets, which is not everyone. But if really what people are looking for is getting their hands dirty and doing uh, specific footwork that gets to impact the lives of everyone using our stuff, the working groups are a great, great place to look into when getting involved. Excellent. Thank you for this very interesting and very intriguing details of the two working groups. Um, I'm following the working groups and I learned a lot even, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fred. All right. Thank you for having me. So one more little thing to add, um, or actually two more little things to add. Um, the, the documentation working group um, has been merged into the build and packaging working group. So uh, all the improvements about documentation in the shell and and uh, the, the improvements in the documentation formatting um, is now be dealt in this working group. Um, and another thing that just popped up today, the OTP team decided to in, in, in include Rebar 3 in OTP and use Rebar 3 to build OTP. So this, is, uh, this was in the planning for a long time and um, today they announced the decision. So let's move on. Um, 
from the embedded working group, which is of course very, of course, very close to my heart. Um, being kind of like joining the the Allen community from the embedded side, um, Natalia Cecina will tell us about um, the embedded working group and um, a few funded projects that has been, that have been happening in this group. Hello, Natalia. Um, you're a member of the embedded working group. Um, Tell me, tell me about why you choose the Embedded Working Group and what is your background that got you to the Embedded Working Group? All right, so I'm a lecturer uh, at Bonnus University and my research is very much about scaling distributed systems. In particular, I'm very interested in robotics and that's what mainly brought me there. And I'm also fascinated with Erlang and I would love to Erlang um, bring uh, scalability and full tolerance that it has into robotics as well so that's that's my path into embedded systems okay um, that gets us about um, our funded project so in the Bene working group has a few funded projects um, um, and um, I think one of you one of those is your favorite um, what would that be yes yes that's Rosie and uh, so what does Rosie I'm stand for it's Ross integrating Erlang. <laughs> um, so actually, we try to sort of lift from the ground this idea for quite a number of years now. So the first paper was published in 2016. And so sort of it's a really slow walk and we try to apply for EU funding and uh, uh, some other things. And uh, finally, finally, we've got some um, support from Erlang Foundation. And this work will be done uh, with the um, university in Italy. So it's uh, Walter uh, Casola and his group. And uh, at the moment, a uh, student, MSC student is going to work with you and we hope to get uh, some wisdom from you as well here. <laughs> so um, an so idea so. there, <laughs> yes, is so, that we will- for, for, for everyone who doesn't know what ROS is, can you can you like give a short explanation what what ROS is actually? Like yes, written so ROS. ROS. Uh, ROS is robot operating system, and actually it's not an operating system; it's middleware. It's hugely popular. It's uh, used all over the world. It's open source, and the idea is that no single lab or institute can do you know, to handle robotics anymore. And we need uh, contributions from all over the world. So um, academics use it a lot because it's sort of like a, um, a tool that they can use, they can use uh, state of the art tools that they don't want to develop and focus their develop uh, development and developing state of the art tools that they can contribute. And at the same time, industry is also quite um, enthusiastic about ROS uh, because uh, they get all these tools, they're um, you know, open source, free to use, and also um, academics and other companies that are also using them. And there are actually quite a number of industrial projects that actually use ROS in their products. So ROS is huge. Uh, there is ROS2 as well, that's picking up the speed as well. It's uh, distributed. It doesn't have this single uh, uh, point of failure. They also introduced uh, this um, communication layer and uh, that the design was that it's replaceable. And that's what actually Rosie tries to do. We want to replace this communication with the uh, reliable or tolerant Erlang. And um, the, the start, Rosie, is uh, developing this communication protocol. Okay, so ROS2 is a distributed system already. Um, and it also has nodes, I, I did some reading. <laughs> and, uh, and, and these nodes communicate with the protocol and um, we probably want to speak this protocol also. So we can kind of like do a mixed deployment of, yes. of like traditional yeah, ROS right. nodes. Yes, yeah. that's another thing. At the moment, ROS and ROS2, they don't talk to each other. And if we replace communication with Erlang, hopefully we can develop an API where all these two systems can talk to each other. Ah, okay, good. That's Fantastic. excellent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what else do you like about the Embedded Working Group? And, uh, or maybe the Erlang Foundation, pick your... Yes, I think I'll talk about the group. Um, I like that um, we meet regularly. <laughs> 
always, you know, every two weeks. Um, I like enthusiasm, you know. I love that we sort of put the goals and we put um, actions for our, our next week and everybody delivers that and updates everybody. So I like that there is no pressure, but at the same time, people sort of promise what they can do and just deliver that, uh, you know, whatever little uh, that can be. Um, I like that there is a sort of um, movement forward. So we had a number of actions that we wanted to achieve. And actually by the, I think end of January, we achieved everything and actually started looking at some other things that we want to look at. Uh, so yeah, these are the things I really love that there is a constant progress, there is enthusiasm from people and there is sort of community around embedded systems to make it, you know, Erlang to be present there. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm also in the embedded working group, um, so I can actually um, share this and I, I, I have to admit that um, everything is going much more smoothly since you joined. Um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> very crucial to actually getting us more well organized and getting actually get us some goals and this actually showed since we have three funded projects now and i think i think more than any other working group at the moment mm -hmm. um and i'm i'm really proud about that that we kind of like managed to kind of like pull through and and yeah. actually do something and and yeah. implement things and more coming. There is, there is yes. sort of there is lots of interest about it, and it's it's amazing because in the beginning it was well beginning for me there were lots of sort of uh, disappointment about this project, and it's amazing to see that people actually uh, now join our meetings just to get their uh, you know projects funded and you know get get an idea as what is funded, how to write proposal, and you know move forward what they're passionate about. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for joining the Better Working Group. It really helped a lot. <laughs> thank you. So there's one more interview. Last but not the least, Brian Paxton. Um, very, very active in the foundation since the start, um, um, helping us with lots of infrastructure, built the latest version of the website and is basically constantly everywhere and doing everything for everybody. So really um, a clap of hands from, from myself for Brian. Um, we would not be where we would be without him. So let's hear it from him. And then after this interview, we finally can head to our BS. Hi, Brian, um, nice to have you here. Um, so you have been active quite for a long time, right from the beginning almost of the Erlang Foundation. And um, today you mainly will be talking about um, infrastructure and marketing working group, um, yes. but you're also very active in the building and packaging working group, but we already have another interview for that. Yes. So tell me about marketing and infrastructure in whatever order you want. So, uh... I got involved with the marketing working group shortly after the inception of the foundation. Um, I came on to, uh, I saw an opportunity to help with the website. Um, and that turned from one thing into another. Um, and uh, we, we kicked around some ideas for taking it from WordPress to a static site um, in order to, um, uh, the, the, the hope was is to increase contribution um, from the community and make it open source and so forth. Um, we, I started off with a Hugo prototype and then uh, we played around with some Erlang and Elixir static site generators. Ultimately, we decided to uh, use Phoenix and the site, uh, the site mostly remained static for a while. Um, and uh, then things just kept evolving and evolving and we saw a need to put a database back behind it and and so forth and so on but the, that was that that was my original involvement in marketing um and uh there's been a lot of work in that area over the over the, over the past few years and we've gotten help from a few different people um it might be helpful to talk about um uh a little bit more of the history of the marketing group you know um yeah do so it was started by uh, you know Desmond Bowie and um, uh, Miriam Pina, 
um, and and then a whole bunch of people joined, and it was mostly engineers, and that that was to be expected. But you know that in conjunction with um, the website being owned by marketing, it really started to become more of a technical group than marketing. So we then shifted the website, the ownership of the website, mostly into infrastructure, though things bleed over. Uh, Which was a new working group back then, I remember. Like we yes, it funded it for that reason, because we have this infrastructure stuff that is actually not marketing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so uh, marketing slowly uh, started to become a marketing working group again. Uh, you know, we we mainly focus on um, uh, you know some of the things we do, which is onboarding of new sponsors, specifically uh, with sponsors uh, on, uh, on getting their logos and aligning on initial announcements for sponsors. We work with all the working groups to spread news about activities within their working groups. Uh, we manage communications such as Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, newsletters, et cetera, and so forth. And we also brainstorm and try to come up with ways to further promote the ecosystem. And there's always opportunities presenting themselves. Um, so uh, that's, I, I think that's a little bit of history. Do you have any? Well, um, speaking of the marketing uh, working group, so currently you are the acting chair there, um, like as of recently, because you're just uh, always there anyway <laughs> yeah um and I, I i really appreciate that you picked up the the bonton and kind of like make make more presence there and i think the rest i, I think it will be more easy to kind, kind of like come up with things no it will not be more easy but i think the i like the professionalization of the marketing thing because it always pulls things from you so if they run out of content they come to us and say what more or exactly. if they need infrastructure, they say we need this. And that again triggers things because you don't have to do it this half of the thing by yourself, but then we can provide the things that we can do best. Exactly. Provide good infrastructure and, and talk about the stuff we love and, and, and provide the content. But the content is not like it's more pulled, not push, because exactly. the push always needs some extra energy. And um, it's amazing uh, to me how, you know, you think to yourself, okay, um, doing tweets, sending out emails, um, maybe doing newsletters, et cetera. Okay, I can do that, not a, not, not a big deal. Well, you have been quite busy in the past about this before we had the marketing team. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, I, I think the point I was trying to get at was that uh, it's all time and energy, all of it. Yeah, um, it's all work and then, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think as engineers, we, we like, you know, we like to build things and we think that we can just solve all the problems, but you can't solve the problem of time and energy. Um, uh, yeah. that, that's the lesson that I've learned personally over the past few years. Um, but, you know, um, so I, as I was saying a few minutes ago, um, the website started off in, in the marketing working group and then it moved to infrastructure. And I think that 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 was a good move, not only for the marketing group, um, but uh, it, it it helps. You know, um, we 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 can have more focused discussions about the tooling that we need um, as far as the website goes, and that's evolving now. We're it's starting to become more than just a presentation site, but it's starting to become useful for the community yeah. and and working groups and the board as well. Um, so all of this is very exciting. Um, I'm tightening up the back end right now and getting some things cleaned up. You know, the websites had a really weird evolution. And so there was a lot of technical debt, if you will, that has come along with yes. that. It's but just I'm, quite young, but it's already has some quite, quite some history. Yes, it does. It has a lot of interesting history, but we're tightening that up right now. Mm -hmm. And um, then I, I, I think we're going to start really earnestly reaching out to the community to try to help us. Um, but yeah. I really wanted to get it, get it in a place where nobody had to deal with that funky history first. Um, yeah. But uh, it's it's but this is an interesting uh, point we've gotten to though, where things are you know bleeding over from one working group to another. But I think that's a good thing, right? We're starting. I think that's excellent. Yes, I love this. Yeah, we're Plus. starting to converge. You know, for example, today um, uh, we found out that we weren't accepted to Google Summer of Code, uh, and 
and we uh, immediately, at least I saw an opportunity that, hey, well, why don't we just have our own summer of code? And yeah. the, the interesting point about that is that- I love it, that idea. Yeah, it, 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 it's gonna cause convergence of several working groups, ranging from mm -hmm. building and packaging, possibly embedded, uh, the education working group and then marketing as well, which has already had its own, you know, set of goals as far as, you know, reaching outside of our own community. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, one of the things that we've spoken a lot about in marketing is that perhaps that we talk to ourselves too much in that regard. Yeah. And we really need to start <laughs> reaching out to communities like Rust and Python and so forth. Yeah. Um, it might be helpful for me to comment on some things that are uh, coming up. Um, yeah, that's that's about what I want to ask you. What what's coming up? What's next things? Um, what's the future? One of one of the things that I'm really excited about that's coming up, and the the Marcom team's uh, going to be um, uh, uh, carrying out this work primarily. We're going to start conducting interviews with a focus on not so well known people in the community, and we feel this is extremely important to growing our ecosystem. And it's not something you typically see a lot, not even in other foundations. There's always, you know, the spotlights being, uh, being put on um, uh, people uh, that the community already knows about. And they're already quite familiar with their accomplishments. And we all, you know, um, uh, love and respect these people and admire them. But I don't think that this helps grow a community. I think what what is is going to help further grow our community is shining a light on people that aren't so well known and and mm -hmm. and, and i don't mean just you know um uh, ranging from people that maybe maybe have not got a lot of recognition over the years to people that have literally just got into this you know maybe they just started uh, a job you know and um they've just been noodling around with uh, erling and elixir for the past couple of years because i think that's that's gonna you know um, say to people, uh, I can do this too. I can get into this. This is not something without, uh, that's, this is something that's within my reach. Um, uh, I think to some people, uh, perhaps that the beam, uh, Erling Elixir functional programming, it seems very, you know, um, complicated and, and, and complex and maybe even very mathematical to some people, which it is at, you know, one level, but, um, I, yeah, I, I really want to um, uh, help, uh, or rather we, the marketing group, we really want to help put a, a spotlight on the next generation of Erlangers, Elixirists, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're in a good track now. I so, think so I think we can call this a wrap for today um, because otherwise I really have a two hour keynote. <laughs> I hope okay. I don't. <laughs> So thank you for your time and thank you for your insight and keep up the good work. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Pierre. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye. Yes, it was not a two-hour keynote, but yeah, I apologize for it being a little bit longer than expected. Um, it's my first set of interview I record and um, I recorded and um, I, we learned a lot about like how hard it is to cut interviews if you need to shorten them. Um, if you don't prepare for that, having gaps and all kinds of things. Um, so it actually, we, we tried what we could to, to kind of like tighten the, the content, but it, it didn't work out. So one last slide uh, before the beers, basically, or before the token groups. Um, we are having an election. The board election is um, upcoming. Um, today is the last day to submit your candidacy, midnight. Not far away. I don't know if anybody is still have, having something in the pipeline. Um, if you only start now, it's probably a little bit late um, to actually submit, but uh, we pre announced it quite a lot. And uh, from tomorrow to basically for one week, the votes are open. And under the link that, uh, that's, that's underneath there, that there you have the details, or you just head to their website and scroll down, and then you see the election thing. So um, if you're eligible to vote, which is basically everybody um, except the free basic membership. So working and managing, supporting, lifetime supporting fellows, um, all these groups um, are eligible to vote. Um, please do so um, and give the, the, the next tier. We're only voting for one third of the board in, in every year. 
so we don't have too much kind of like change in every given year um your vote um and with that i will head upstairs and grab a beer because i think for me it's really late now um in munich um and i deserve my beer now um it's 10 30 here in london it's uh, well 11 30 yes. in munich oh you're and, still here uh, i didn't see I'm you i'm still here yes 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 yeah. i am i am even though I'm heading over to the Tukan Lounge, so uh, you can find the link in the app. Uh, you can find also, yeah, the link in uh, the Zoom chat if uh, you just Zoom uh, through the foundation links. And see you there and, and come and socialize. You know, thank you so much, Pierre, and thank you everyone in the foundation who've you know, made, well, uh, 2020 probably a year to remember for the right reasons and not the wrong ones. All right. Thank you, everyone. So that, um, one, one more thing. Basically, there will be the working groups uh, represented in the in the launches. So head there. I will head over to Embedded and see you there and tell you the latest.